Hello dear students, welcome to the eMath learning platform for the solutions to online assessment one. Now to give you a few updates, the next assessment will be posted next week on Tuesday evening uh, on my YouTube channel that is eMath learning platform. And for now we are going to specifically look at the solutions to section A type questions. Remember to subscribe in case you had not, such that you're always updated of all that is going on on our platform for e-learning. Let's go direct and begin with question one. So question one says, given that P operation Q equals to 3P plus Q squared minus PQ, find the value of Roman 1, 3 operation 5. Roman 2, 3 operation 5, operation negative 1. Uh, let's, let's look at the solutions for this. But before we do much about that, we should first know that in operations, it is a matter of simply comparing. For example, when I have P operation Q, I compare it with 3 operation 5. So it means P corresponds to 3 and Q corresponds to 5. What does that mean? That simply means that for us to get 3 operation 5, we simply substitute for P as 3 and Q as 5 in this formula. So that will be our solution or the first step uh, for Roman 1. And of course, after substituting like we have done in this step, you simply simplify. And I'm sure when you simplify that and add correctly, then subtract the 15, you will come up with 19 as your result for Roman 1. Now, when you look at Roman 2, it has three operation 5, which appeared in Roman 1. But remember, you've already got three operation 5 as 19. So it means saying three operation 5 operation negative 1 is the same as saying 19 operation uh, negative 1. So that is going to be our first step for Roman 2, simply because this is already obtained in Roman 1 and it is 19. So now it means we are going to do the comparison between 19 operation negative 1 and P operation Q. So it means again P now becomes 19 and Q becomes negative 1. So we shall again substitute for P as 19 in this formula and substitute for Q as negative 1. So that will be our first step for that. And of course, the other thing is simply simplifying this. Multiply 19 by 3, add negative 1 but squared. Then if you multiply negative 19 by negative 1, you get positive 19. So that gives us 57 plus 1 plus 19. And if you add this, you come up with 77. So that gives us the solution for question 1. Let's go to question 2. Let's go to question two. So question two says, Jane bought three pencils and four books at a total cost of shillings 4,900. Tom bought five pencils and six books at a total of shillings 7,500. Determine the price of each pencil and each book if they bought from the same shop. This is an interesting question. So this question tests for the application of simultaneous equations. Why do we say so? It's because if someone tells you that you are buying, I mean, Jen buys three pencils and four books at a total cost of 4,900. Then Tom buys five pencils and six books at a total cost of 7,500. Now they tell us to determine the price of each pencil. It means if I say X, X is the price of each pencil and maybe Y is the price of each book, then it means for me to buy three pencils, I will be paying three times X shillings. For me to buy four books, I will be paying four times Y shillings. But when I add the total amount of money I will have spent, it should be equating to 4,900. The same thing happens to the case of Tom. So it means five pencils will be five times X shillings. Then six books will be six times Y shillings and that should be totaling to 7500 so that will give us the two simultaneous equations as we see below then the next step of course is simply solving these two simultaneous equations using any method of your choice and of course for section a type questions we normally prefer using shorter 
methods. You can use elimination, you can use substitution, or you can use the matrix method. Now, I'm going to simply use elimination method, but for elimination method, as you see, if we decide to eliminate x in this case, I am simply going to multiply equation 1 by the coefficient of x, which is 5 in the second equation. Then I multiply equation 2 by the coefficient of x in the first equation. So that gives me 15x plus 20y is equal to 24,500. Then 15x plus 18y gives me 22,500. Remember, the value you are multiplying with in each case should multiply each of the terms. So it means if we are multiplying this first equation by 5, it should multiply 3x, it should multiply 4y, it should also multiply 4,900. And the same thing happens in equation 2. Then in this case, if I want to eliminate x, I simply subtract the two equations. So now when you subtract uh, this equation 2 from equation 1, like we are having, you will end up with uh, 2y equals to 2,000. How does that come about? When you get 20y minus 18y, you get 2y. And when you get 24,500 minus 22,500, you get 2,000. And of course, when you divide through by 2 by 2, the value of y becomes 1,000 shillings. Then automatically, we can use any of the equations. For example, from equation 1, I am going to simply substitute for the value of y, which is 1,000. So when I put it here, where there is y, then it means I'll have 3x plus 4 into 1,000, giving us 4,900. Then if you multiply 4 times 1,000, you get 4,000, which we can uh, move to the right-hand side, such that we have 3x as 4,900 minus 4,000. And if you subtract that, you will come up with 3x, giving us 9. So, of course, from this level, we simply divide through by 3 by 3 on both sides, such that we get the value of x as 300. So that is our solution for uh, question 2. Our conclusion now becomes the prices of each pencil and each book. I mean, the prices of each pencil and book are shillings, 300 and shillings, 1,000 respectively. Question 3. Line y plus x equals to 2 is reflected in the y-axis. Find the equation of the image of this line after this transformation. This is a good question. Now, since they're telling us that this line is reflected in the y-axis, it means we are going to first go obtain a graph paper, represent this line, and then we do the reflection along the y-axis. So before we do that, uh, we are going to first assume a few points because we want to see how we can represent this line on a graph. So for example, if I assume that x is 0, then automatically y will be 2. And if I assume that y is 0, then automatically x will be 2. So that will give us the two coordinates which will guide us to draw our line y plus x equals to 2. Now let me take you to a graph. We look at how uh, we're going to draw the line and do the reflection. So here is my graph with well-labeled axis. Now we're going to plot the points. Uh, the first point that we saw here was the uh, 0, 2. So 0, 2 will be at this point here that I'm pointing at. And the, the other one will be 2, 0, like we got. So it means if we are to represent the points, uh, our point P, our point P is going to be here. So this is going to be point P. And our point Q is going to be at 2, 0, which is at this point here. Then automatically, we can see how to draw our line. So let me draw a line. So we shall have our line from P joined to Q. This is our line. We can make it a little bit bold for you to see it clearly. Yes, that is our line. Then, now remember, this is the y-axis, which is our mirror line. So this is like our mirror. We are going to reflect point P and point Q. Now, when you look at point P, it is already along the mirror line. So it means even the image of P will still remain on that same point, simply because there is no distance between the object and the mirror line. 
So because it is along the mirror line, even the image of P, that will be P prime, will also remain at that very point. So it means our image will also be at this very point here. So it means the image which is P prime is going to be 0 what? 0, 2. It will be 0, 2. Then for Q prime, look for the image of Q. We are going to simply look at this point here. So for us to reflect it, we are going to look at the distance from this point Q to our mirror line, which is the y-axis. When you look at this clearly, these are like two units. So it means I will also count two units to the left-hand side, such that I be sure that the image, which is going to be Q prime, is now going to be at negative 2. What does this tell us? It tells us that now our new line is going to be uh, line P prime, Q prime. And if I try to join them, I will come up with uh, a line like this. This is our line. can also make it bold for you to see it well. Maybe I can also differentiate it from the other one by simply uh, having it in a dotted form. So that is our line, P prime, Q prime. Take, a note, take note of this, that P prime and P are sharing the same point, simply because P was already along the line of reflection. Now, the only thing we are now going to do is take note of these two points. Now, Q prime is negative 2, 0, and P prime is 0, 2. So it means we are now going to get the equation of the line of P prime, Q prime. And because you already have the two points, we now get the equation of the line normally. So can we look at that process? Now? So now we have uh, P prime as 0, 2, Q prime as negative 2, 0. So we first begin by getting the gradient. Uh, but of course, remember, to get the gradient from this, we shall have to first use the formula, which is given by uh, m equals to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if we try to use that formula, it means we shall have our gradient, which is m, our y2, remember, from these two points, it is a choice. Uh, I am going to consider uh, any of the y coordinates, as we see here, to be y2, and any of them to be y1. So for example, here I have 2 minus 0. So it means I've taken this as y2 and this as y1. You can also take the reverse. It will also give you the same answer, but make sure you maintain it for even x2 and Now, like in this case, I have x2 as 0 and x1 as negative 2. But remember here, it was supposed to be 0 minus negative 2. That is how the plus came about. And of course, when you do this, automatically you expect the value of m to be 1. So from there, we can now go on and look for the equation of the line. Remember, we can also have a formula which says y minus y1 over x minus x1 equals to the gradient. So in this case, I am going to consider my y1 as 2 and x1 as 0. So it means if I already have this, if I already have this, now remember we already had the gradient as 1. So from that point, it will lead us to y minus 2 out of x, because x minus 0 is x equals to 1. The next step will simply be cross multiplication, whereby we have y minus 2 is equals to x. And automatically, we can simply move 2 to the right-hand side, and that gives us the equation of the line uh, that is formed as the image of this line that we were given in our question. So that leads us to the solution of question three. Now we can move on and look at uh, question four. Question four, they are saying factorize the quadratic expression. This should be expression first, I think. We cannot just one. So we have the quadratic expression for x squared minus 11x minus three. Then finally, hence we solve the quadratic equation, this. Now let's begin with four x squared minus 11x minus three, which is our quadratic expression. The first step here is looking for the product, the sum, and finally the factors. How do we look for them? Let's first go for some side work. Now we're going to say product is equals negative 12. How do we get negative 12? By simply multiplying the coefficient of x squared, which is 4 in this case, 
you multiply it by negative 3, that gives you negative 12. Then the sum, you simply look at the coefficient of x together with its sign, and now that gives us negative 11. Then for factors, these are simply two values that can be multiplied together to give us negative 12. But when added together, we shall get negative 11. Now when you look at negative 12 times 1, you indeed get negative 12. Negative 12 plus 1, you indeed get negative 11. So it qualifies to be one of the best choices we can make in this case. Then now, what you're going to do, get the factors you've obtained. We have negative 12, multiply it by x. Get 1, also multiply it by x. Then they will replace negative 11. That is why we are saying in this case we have 4x squared minus 12x plus x minus 3. Then from that point, we now look at them as pairs. When I look at this pair, 4x is the common factor. And in this case, there will be 1. Of course, there is no common factor between x and negative 3 except 1 that we can pull out. So that will lead us to, uh, this should be 4x. So it is 4x into x minus 3 plus 1 into x minus 3. Now make sure that when you open up these two brackets, you still go back to what we have up here in the second step. Then from this point, you realize there is a common bracket, which is containing x minus 3, x minus 3. So it means x minus 3 is also a common factor. When you factorize it out, you will remain with 4x plus 1, which also gives us another factor. Then our common factor is x minus 3. So at this level, we shall have factorized this expression. The next step is simply going to be solving. But remember, this expression that we have on the left-hand side is just the same as this. So to solve it, simply equate what you've ended up with here to zero. And when you equate it to zero, either this factor is going to be equals to zero or this factor is going to be equals to zero. If this is equals to zero, then automatically it means x will be negative a quarter. And if this is equals to zero, automatically x will be positive three. So by that level, you will have solved the quadratic equation. Question five. The forest covering an area of 172.8 kilometers squared is represented on a map by an area of 10.8 centimeters squared. Determine the scale of this map. Let's look at the solution to that. So the solution to that. So we shall start by saying 10.8 centimeters squared on a map equal to 172.8 kilometers squared on land as it was stated in the question. Now, if 10.8 centimeters squared on a map represents this on land, what about only one centimeter squared? So one centimeter squared will be, will be representing 172.8 divided by 10.8 kilometers squared on land. Then in addition to this, we shall now go and look for only what one centimeter represents. Now, remember this was one centimeter squared. Now, to get one centimeter alone, you simply take a square root of this. And of course, when you take a square root of this, you automatically also take the square root on the right-hand side. So the square root of one centimeter squared on a map will be equal to the square root of 172.8 divided by 10.8 kilometer squared. So that gives you one centimeter on a map uh, being the same as four kilometers on land. Then... Now, what you're going to now do is to simply convert the 4 kilometers into centimeters. Because remember, for you to write a scale, the scale should have the same units. And we normally prefer smaller units to bigger units because they are the ones that can easily fit on a map. So it means if you convert 4 kilometers, that will be 400,000 centimeters. Simply because we have multiplied 4 by 100,000 centimeters. Now, that gives us one centimeter on a map being the same as 400,000 centimeters on land. And automatically here, we can now state our scale as 1 to 4,000. So it means one centimeter on a map represents 400,000 centimeters on land. Question 6. Two quantities, P and Q, are such that P is inversely proportional to the square root of Q. And Q equals to 4 when P equals to 10. Find the values of Q and P. Let's look at the solution for this. 
So we're going to first write our expression because they told you that P is inversely proportional to Q. So this is supposed to be 1 instead of K that we what, that, that appeared at first. So now if P is inversely proportional to 1 out of square root of Q, then to remove the proportionality symbol, we simply introduce what we call the proportionality constant K. So when you multiply this by k, automatically it becomes k out of square root of q. Then remember, they gave you conditions that when q equals to 4, automatically p is 10. So we are going to substitute for p as 10 and q as 4. And when you do so, you will have 10 equals to k out of square root of 4. But remember, square root of 4 is 2. So 2 will now multiply the 10 by cross multiplication. And that gives us k as 20. After getting the value of k as 20, you simply come back and simply substitute the value of k here. And that will give you an expression p equals to 20 out of square root of q. Then from here, we now look at the new condition they gave us. Remember, they told us to find q when p equals to 0.05. So it means wherever there is p, I'm going to put 0.05, but we don't know the value of q. And so we shall have to look for it. So if 0 0.05 is equal to 20 out of square root of q, what are we going to do? We are going to automatically cross multiply. After cross multiplying, divide through by 0 0.05. Then after we square both sides. So I've not showed all those steps, but when you do what I've just said, you will get the value of q as 160,000. So that leads us to that question. We can now move on to the next question. And that is question e. that is question seven. So question seven says given that h inverse of x is equals to three out of five x minus two, find an expression for h of x. Hence find h of two. Now they have given us the inverse function and they want us to get the original function, which is hx. But of course the way you get hx from h inverse of x is the same way as getting uh, h inverse of x when you're given h of x. So the procedures are going to be the same, only that this time we shall begin by saying let any letter of our choice, for example y, equal to h inverse of x. And if that is true, it means now y is equal to 3 out of 5x minus 2, which was given here. Remember, this is already y. Then we're going to simply cross, multiply, then make x the subject. So when we cross multiply, we have this, and so we are going to open the brackets such that we have 5xy minus 2y is equal to 3. Now our x is here. For us to make it the subject, we shall first take the 2y the other side, then later divide by 5y. So that is uh, the step that we are going to. Then after here, of course, we can now divide by 5y on both sides such that we have 3 plus 2y out of 5y. Now that this is the value of x, we simply conclude that h of x is equal to 3 plus 2x out of 5x. Then to answer this other part where they said h of 2, it means you simply substitute for 2 wherever you see x in h of x. So that will be our substitution, and automatically the final answer will be 7 out of 10. Someone can as well write 0 0.7. Let's go to question 8. Question 8 says, if US dollars 420 is equivalent to Uganda shillings 1,659,000, one find the Roman 1, the exchange rate. Roman 2, equivalent of Uganda shillings 750,500 in dollars. A good question for us. Solution. Now, the first thing we know is that for 120 United States dollars is equivalent to this amount in Ugandan shillings. So, what about one US dollar? So, one US dollar will automatically be this amount divided by 420, and that will be in Ugandan shillings. So, it means one US dollar will be Ugandan shillings 3,950. Then, from this point, uh, remember they asked us for the exchange rate in Roman 1 and so this is actually the exchange rate for $1 uh, being exchanged with Ugandan shillings. Then Roman 2, they asked us to the amount which is equivalent 
sorry, the amount equivalent of Ugandan shillings, this in dollars. So it means we're going to say Ugandan shillings, 750,000, will automatically be this amount divided by the exchange rate, which is 3,950. And when you do that, you will come up with US dollars 190. And so it means that gives us our solution for question 8. Question 9. Use matrix method to solve the simultaneous equations. 7x equals to 31 minus 10y. Then 10 minus 2x equals to 4y. Let's look at the solution to question 9. The solution, we are going to simply begin with uh, looking at our expressions or the simultaneous equations they gave us. We're going to first rearrange, so I'm going to move the 10y this side. I also move the y, 4y I mean, this side, and I take the 10 the other side. Then after, you simply write the coefficients of x and y in the format that you see in this first step of our solution. So you have 7, 2, 10, 4. So 7 and 2 are coefficients of x after rearranging the equations, then 10 and 4 are coefficients of y. Then you multiply by... Uh, a 2 by 1 matrix xy giving you 31 10 these are the values that we had on the right hand sides of the two equations above then from this point we now look at this matrix here you look for its adjoint now when you look for the adjoint of this matrix it will simply be uh, 4 7 then negative 2 negative 10 what has happened here is that we have exchanged the elements, the positions of the elements in the major diagonal, and we have changed the signs of the elements in the minor diagonal. So after getting that adjoint matrix, you multiply it on both sides of this first expression, but you make sure you begin with the adjoint matrix. As you see here, I started with it, and I also started with it. Then from this, you're going to simply multiply this matrix by this matrix. For example, I can say 4 times 7, I'll get 28. Then negative 10 times 2, I'll get negative 20. When I add them, I will come up with 8. The same thing will be uh, when you go through 4 by 10, that will be 40. Negative 10 by 4, that will be negative 40. When you add them, you get 0. So you simply multiply a row by column, and you come up with this matrix 8, 0, 0, 8 into x, y is equals to this. So I've also obtained 24. Eight by simply multiplying a row by this column and this other row by this column. So from this point, we can now be sure that 8 times x is 8x, but 0 times y is 0. Then 0 times x is 0, and 8 times y is 8y. So it means we'll have 8x, 8y equals to 24, 8. So from there, we can equate the corresponding elements. So it means 8x is equal to 24. And if you divide by 8, you get the value of x as 3. The same thing happens to 8y and 8. So if 8y is also 8, then it means y will be 1. Now, this is one way of using the matrix method. Someone else can use the determinant approach, what we call Kramer's rule, because it also involves getting the determinant, and so determinant is also under matrices. So that method uh, can also still give us the same result. So can we now go to question 10? Question 10, they are saying two dice are tossed together and each pair of numbers that appear uppermost is recorded. Construct a table for the products of all the possible outcomes. Roman to find the probability that the product of, the, of that pair is greater than 29. Let's look at the solution for this. Now we have two dice. We have one, remember a die, one die like this has six faces. So the first die, I'm going to represent it with faces one, two, three, four, five, six. And the second is also having one, two, three, four, five, six. Now remember they told you product of the outcomes. So you simply say one times one, you get one. One times two, you get two. One times three, you get three. One times four, you get four. 1 times 5, you get 5. And 1 times 6, you also get 6. The same thing happens in this case. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4. And you continue in the same way until you 
complete your table as you see it here. Now, the second question was asking for the probability uh, of getting a number greater than 29. When you check out in our outcomes, these ones here that you see, there are a few numbers that we can see which are greater than 29. For example, there is 30 here, there is another 30, and there is 36. How many are they? There are only three numbers which are greater than 29. So we say the probability will be the number of events, which is three, out of the number of the sample space. Remember, the sample space is all this. And if you count all these outcomes, there are about 36 of them. So it means you'll have three out of 36, which can be simplified to one out of 12. And this brings us to the end of solution to question 10. Now, like we said, we shall continue with the section B type questions. And probably that will happen next week on Monday. Then the next test uh, will be on Tuesday at 6 p.m. So for your Vox students, make sure you're there because we are moving on as we prepare for our final students. I mean, as we prepare for our final examination. Sorry for that. Uh, so from this point, I remind you to subscribe to my YouTube channel because like we said, when you subscribe, you will always be alerted whenever I post new content. Thank you so much for being